We are going to join with all of heaven and the angels singing glory in the highest to the Lord. of God in the land of the living, as it says in Psalm 27. And God, we just bring you our hunger and our expectation this morning, Lord, for the things that we have been praying for and believing, God. I was just so reminded today that even when we're in the middle of the story, Lord, and things don't look like what we thought, God, you are still faithful and you are still the solid rock that we are standing on. So today, God, we just bring you our worship right in the middle of wherever we are, Lord. It's a gift to get to praise you right in the middle of it, Lord. So we just lift our worship in this place today. We sing out. Christ is my firm foundation. Everything around me is shaking. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. Cause he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. 
sending your son Jesus to our rescue to become one of us Lord and we thank you for his glory for his grace and the mercy that he pours out in our lives we love you Lord in Jesus name amen you guys can be seated this morning he's worthy of our adoration amen he's worthy the king of kings and lord of lords I'm Donnie Thomas. I'm one of the pastors here at Owensboro Christian Church. And uh, whether you're watching online today or whether you're watching on TV or you're here uh, with us this morning in person, we're just so glad you're here and just want to say welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, I also want to thank you for your giving, your tithes, and your offerings uh, each and every week. Uh, they enable the church here to be able to fulfill the mission. Uh, that God has placed upon the church. Uh, just uh, all around the globe, we're able to share the message of Jesus. We're able to provide ministries that take place on this campus. And then we're also able to partner uh, with people in our community as well. One of those partnerships uh, that we have, we just completed, and that is our Christmas shop. And I want to thank you for all the donations that you made to the Christmas shop, whether it was toys or money. And I just want to share with you, we partner, we partner with uh, uh, the family resource workers and a lot of schools in our area, and then we also partner with a lot of the recovery community as well. And I want you to know, listen to this, as a result of your giving, we were able to help 140 families with Christmas. That results in 400, roughly 400 children having a great Christmas this year. So thank you. Thank you for what you did, and uh, it's just going to be a special moment for a lot of families as a result of you being willing to give and share with others. Speaking of Christmas, it's a week away. Are you ready? A week away. In fact, I want to share with you, remind you about our Christmas Eve uh, candlelight services that will be taking place. Uh, we'll be having our regular services plus one, and they will be identical services. So Saturday night at 530, and then also Sunday at 915, and then this service, 1045, and then the plus one is the one on Sunday afternoon at 1 p.m., 1 p.m., Saturday at 530, Sunday, 9.15, 10.45, and then the added one will be at 1 p.m. on Sunday. And I want to encourage you to invite and bring some people with you. In fact, I have some invite cards. We have some of those available outside the worship center here on a little table. You know, a lot of times people are more than uh, are willing uh, to come to church uh, during special times. And Christmas is one of those special times. If you would invite people, they will come. So I want to encourage you to pick up some of these cards as you leave today. There's a bunch of them out there. If you need five, ten, pick up whatever you need. But personally invite people to come. We want them to experience Jesus as well. Amen? Amen. All right. Take your Bibles, take your phone app, and turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. What do you want for Christmas? That question sparks the imagination of many children, and quite a few adults too, if we're honest. Perhaps some of you are old enough to remember the excitement the day the J.C. Penney catalog arrived in the mail. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. And you would open up the J.C. Penney catalog and flip to the toy section and start to circle all the different gifts and toys that you wanted 
for Christmas. Then it became the uh, Black Friday ads in the newspaper from all the big box stores that we would comb through for Christmas gift ideas. This year, my family and I are making an Amazon wish list, personally, of the gifts that we want for Christmas. But growing up, do you remember the gift that you wanted for Christmas? I can think of three gifts I really wanted. First was the Batman action figure set, complete with Batmobile and Batcave, of course. Then, as I got a little older, I wanted a BMX bicycle. My mom wasn't super excited about me getting that. She was afraid I was going to hurt myself. I did a little bit, but it was still an awesome, awesome gift. The third one I can remember that I really wanted was the boombox with the detachable speakers. You know what I'm talking about? This thing was awesome. There is excitement and anticipation thinking about what we want for Christmas. But have you ever thought about this question? Like, what does God want for Christmas? I know that sounds kind of cheesy at first, but, but hear me out. Like, based on what we know of the story of Jesus in the scriptures, what does God want for us? And maybe equally as important, what does God want from us in response to the gift of his son. That's what we're going to dive into together today from God's word. To those joining us online or on TV or here in person for the first time, welcome. We're so glad to have you with us as we continue this Christmas series through the book of Hebrews, which was written for people to help them see Jesus as the fulfillment of God's plan to the world. And the answer to the questions, what does God want for us and what does God want from us? The answers to that to those questions are actually good news, but to fully appreciate the good news, we need to understand the bad news. So here's the bad news. Sin, our choice to rebel against God, separates us from God while we live here on earth and for eternity when we die. In Genesis chapter 2, God made Adam and Eve and he set them to live in the Garden of Eden, an earthly paradise that would actually allow them to experience the daily presence of God. But in Genesis chapter 3, they rebelled against God and they sinned, and it fractured the relationship between not just God and Adam and Eve, but God and all of humanity. That's the bad news. Here's the good news. As a God of both justice and love, God designed a covenant with people, a plan to punish sin and restore the sinner back into a relationship with him. And at the cornerstone of this covenant was God's call for people to live holy lives and a yearly animal sacrifice to atone from the times that they disobeyed him. You see, if you read through the new, the, excuse me, the Old Testament, what you'll see is this, this really kind of a weird but special day for the, the nation of Israel. It was called the Day of Atonement. And every year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would walk into the innermost room of the temple and offer an animal sacrifice to atone for, to pay the price for the sins of the people for the previous year. And this allowed the relationship with God to continue. It allowed justice to be served and people to be restored to God. But in our text for it today, in Hebrews chapter 10, there are some Jewish Christians who are a bit confused because they're wondering, like, are we still under this original covenant with God? Or is there a new way to draw near to God in worship? Here's what we read in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. We read that the law, this original covenant, 
is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it, the law, can never by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins, but those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Now, there's a lot of deep theological stuff happening in these first four verses. Let me try to unpack a little bit what the author is doing. The author is describing the original covenant between God and humanity. And this covenant required people to have perfect obedience to God. Perfect obedience. In fact, as we read the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28, and Moses is summarizing this covenant, this original covenant that God made with the nation of Israel, Moses wrote, the Lord will establish you as his holy people, as he promised you on oath, if, here's the condition, if you keep the commands of the Lord your God and walk in obedience to him. Essentially, if you want to be God's holy people, you got to keep all of God's holy laws. Now, there were 613 commands in the Old Testament that the nation of Israel were told to follow. So how well do you think they did keeping all of those laws? Not very well. Not very good, right? In fact, they failed over and over and over again, which is why they needed an annual sacrifice. Year after year, justice was served as an animal took on the punishment for the sins of the people. By this sacrifice, the people's sins were atoned for, the Day of Atonement. But that word also tells us that this annual sacrifice was a temporary solution. Because the word atone in Hebrew means to cover up or cover over something that still remains hidden underneath. So have you ever had company come over last minute? Or maybe you knew company was coming over for dinner, but you didn't have time to clean the house. And so instead of cleaning the house, you kind of gathered your mess and you uh, threw it into the guest room and you shut the door. Or maybe, you, you know, you, some of you know what I'm talking about. Or you, you throw it into a closet and you're like, don't go in there. We, and my wife has done this. I think it's really funny. But like we've had dirty dishes in, in the sink. And so instead of like trying to do them real quick, company's coming over. She just takes like a, like a towel and like covers up the dishes in the sink, right? And, and so, it, you know, it kind of looks clean, but there's still a mess, right? There's still a mess that's hidden underneath. And interestingly, that's what the Day of Atonement did for the nation of Israel. It hid their sins temporarily. Just kind of kept them out of God's sight for the next year. It still remained, which means that the people who lived under this original covenant with God lived with a continual reminder of their guilt. That's what verse 3 tells us. It says that this yearly sacrifice was a reminder of their sins. Every year they would feel guilty all over again for what they had done against God. This is the original covenant. Perfect obedience was required. People couldn't do that, so they needed an annual sacrifice to atone for the sins, which meant it was a temporary solution and a continual reminder of guilt. But now let's go back to verse 1 in our text, and let's reread verse 1. Because the author says that the law, this original covenant way to get to God, is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the reality themselves. 
I want to show you a picture. Uh, this picture is not a picture of an airplane. It is a picture of the shadow of an airplane taken from the plane during takeoff. You can see how the shadow kind of reflects onto the grass by the runway. So this past week, my wife, Laura, and I had the privilege of traveling on a very a short mission trip, three days, to El Salvador to visit with Ryan and Melissa Humphrey to celebrate the opening of a medical clinic that you all helped uh, support both with your finances and your prayers. God is doing an amazing work down there. The, the, the trip was fantastic. But imagine my wife and I packing our bags for El Salvador and driving to the airport. But instead of like going to the actual gate where the plane was, imagine that we somehow got out to the runway. And we sit down on the grass by the runway, and you know, we put our bags next to each other, and we're kind of sitting together. And then my wife opens up her, her bag and pulls out a couple bags of, of uh, pretzels, just like you would on a plane. And we're just sitting there by the runway eating some pretzels, hoping that somehow the shadow passing by would magically pick us up and carry us where we need to go. Well, first off, we'd be arrested. Right? Because you can't do that. Like, you can't go out to the runway of an airport. But second, like, of course that wouldn't work. Because the shadow is not the substance of the plane itself. The shadow can't take us where we need to go. And similarly, this original covenant between God and humanity, it wasn't bad. It wasn't evil. It did allow people to approach God every year in worship, but it couldn't bring the total cleansing that God ultimately desired for us. Verse 1 said it couldn't make perfect those who want to draw near. And because of that, it couldn't provide the relationship with God that he ultimately desired for us. So God made a new covenant with us. And the Apostle Paul describes its arrival like this in Galatians chapter 4. When the fullness of time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons and daughters. So let's read the rest of our text about this new covenant that has come through Jesus. And if you're able to, would you please stand as I read this? We do this out of respect for God's word, but we also want to hear what does God want for us and what does he want from us? Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 5. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, and this, the, this is now a quote from uh, Psalm 40. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. And then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. And now the author is going to describe what this means. First, he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings, you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law, this original covenant. Then he said, here I am, I have come to do your will. He, meaning Jesus, sets aside the first, the first covenant to establish the second and by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever 
those who are being made holy. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Please go ahead and have a seat. I want to show you the amazing contrast the author is drawing between this original covenant and the new covenant that has come through Jesus. The original covenant, if you remember, is dependent on our perfect obedience. It's dependent on what we do. When scripture tells us, we all fall short of the glory of God. But this new covenant is given to us through Jesus' obedience. Earlier in Hebrews chapter 4, the author tells us that Jesus was tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. That's amazing. He was tempted in every way as we are, yet he never rebelled against God. Jesus lived the perfect life that we could never live. And so so drawing near to God is no longer dependent upon what we do, but on what Jesus has done in his perfect obedience to the Father. I love the way that Paul describes this in 2 Corinthians. He said, God made him, Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us, to take on the punishment for our sins, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Because Jesus lived a sinless life, he became our final sacrifice. Seven different times in Hebrews chapters 8 through 10, there is a phrase repeated, once for all, repeated, signifying the finality of Jesus' sacrifice. And in the verses we just read, in verse 11, we read that the priests stand every day to do their duties. Day after day, they stand. They're actively trying to solve a problem. But then in verse 12, we read that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God. Sitting means that Jesus' work of forgiveness is done. It's why his final words on the cross were, It is finished. Like no more yearly sacrifices are needed. Jesus is the final sacrifice required. Which is why Jesus is the permanent solution to the problem we have with sin. The the animal sacrifice would only atone for, cover up, the sins year to year, and it would do that temporarily, but as the perfect and final sacrifice, our punishment for sins are taken away for good. In fact, John the Baptist came to prepare the way for Jesus. And when John saw Jesus approaching, John said to the crowd of people that were listening to him, John pointed to Jesus and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus doesn't hide them. He doesn't temporarily remove them. No, in Jesus, the consequences for our sins are completely and permanently removed. And unlike the original covenant, which was a reminder of guilt, this new covenant provides a continual reminder of grace. The Bible says that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The Bible says if you are in Christ, you are a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. The Bible says if you are in Christ, you are free indeed. The Bible says if you are in Christ that you can draw near to God in confidence, not because of anything we've done, but because of the grace of God through Jesus. And this brings us full circle back to our original question. Like, what does God want? What does God want for us? And what does God want from us? I think Hebrews chapter 10 makes it incredibly clear that God wants to forgive our sins. But it's right here that we have to begin to battle some mental hurdles that each of us might face 
in order for us to fully receive this gift. You see, for some people, some people don't see a need to be forgiven because they don't yet believe in God. And because they don't believe in God, like they don't see anything wrong with the current trajectory of their lives. And if that describes you, then my prayer for you is the same as the prayer of David in Psalm 34, verse 8, when David invited people to taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Like My prayer for you is that you would taste and see like all of who God is, his love and his grace, but also his justice and his judgment so that you would find the need to have your forgiveness found in him. Which leads to another mental hurdle that we might face. Maybe you believe in God, but you don't believe that he's a God of judgment. Like, you don't see a need to be forgiven because in your mind, like, everything's going to work out in the end. Like, if God's a God of love, that he can't punish anybody, and we're all going to be in heaven together with him someday. But the fact is, if God is loving and good, which the Bible says he is, and I certainly believe he is, if he's perfect in love and perfect in goodness, we also need him to be perfect in judgment and in justice. And God exercised perfect love in the sending of his son, but he will also exercise perfect judgment for the bad things that have happened on earth, including towards those who cause it. Please, please hear me when I say this. Sin will be paid for one way or another. Either we're going to pay for it, or we're going to trust Jesus to pay it for us. The late pastor and author Tim Keller said, it is because of the doctrine of judgment and hell that Jesus' proclamations of grace and love are so astounding. In his love and because of his coming judgment, God wants to forgive your sin. Perhaps for you, though, the mental hurdle isn't believing that you need to be forgiven. Perhaps the hurdle is believing that you can be forgiven. The following is a post written to a Christian website seeking advice. The person wrote, my friend says God can forgive anyone, but I don't believe it. I got involved in some really bad things when I was younger, and I know God must hate me for all the hurt I've caused, and I wish I could live my life over again, but of course I can't. I can't. You can just feel the anguish in that post. And maybe you have felt that way yourself, or you feel that way right now. Like, you know that God knows what you've done, and you can't imagine that God wants to or can forgive you. But this is why the Bible calls the gift of Jesus a gift of grace. Grace is something we can't earn, and on our own merits, something we don't deserve. And listen, if God can forgive a man like Moses who killed someone and Paul who persecuted Christians and a woman who sold her body for a living and David who committed adultery and Peter who denied even knowing Jesus, like if God can forgive them and redeem their lives to have an eternal impact on other people, man, God can do the same thing for you. Do you realize under the original covenant that was all dependent upon what we do, even the best person failed because they couldn't live perfectly. But under this new covenant of grace, even the worst sinner can be saved. God wants to and can forgive your sins. 
We also learn from Hebrews 10 that God wants us to trust in Jesus as our only source of forgiveness. I think we live in such a works-based culture. I think we live in, in a culture where so much of our value and our worth and, and our like, perspective we think to other people is dependent upon what we do. And it's so easy in that environment to believe that our relationship with God is also dependent on what we do. And as soon as we start believing the lie that our relationship with God, our forgiveness and relationship is based on how we live, we're going to start asking all the wrong questions. Like, how good is good enough for God to love me? How good do I have to be to be good enough to be saved? Do you know that the Bible actually answers that question? The Bible actually answers the question, how good is good enough to be saved? In James chapter 2, verse 10, James writes, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. Do you realize what that verse means? It says that if we try to get on God's good side by doing good things, it will never be good enough. Because we will all sin. And if we sin and break just one part of God's commands, we're guilty of breaking all of it. And the prophet Isaiah realized this in Isaiah chapter 64 when he wrote, How then can we be saved? All of us have become like one who was unclean. And all of our righteous acts are like filthy rags in the sight of God. But when we trust in the gift of Jesus as our only hope of forgiveness, the best of what we can bring, our filthy rags, those are taken away and we are given the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Paul, as he's writing to the Philippians, says to them that he wants to know God more and more, wants to know Jesus more and more as like the drive of his life. And then he says it in Philippians 3, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God. This is what God wants for you. He wants to forgive your sins and give you the righteousness of his son, Jesus. Which leads to the last question, what does God want from us? We'll look at verse 10 because we kind of get an idea from what we read there. Verse 10 says, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. So this is what we've been talking about. Through Jesus, we have been made holy. It is done. It is complete. It is finished. But then in verse 14, we read, For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Do you catch that? Like verse 10 talks about a completed work of forgiveness. Verse 14 talks about an ongoing work of holiness. So what does God want from you? God wants you to step into the holiness he's already given you in Jesus. The Bible has a big word for this process. It's the word sanctification or sanctify. It means to be set apart for God's purposes. And sanctification is an ongoing work that we must allow God to do in us. How do we do that? Well, we read his word and we pray and we say yes to the things he's inviting us into and no to the things that are going to take us away from God. We step into the holiness he's already given us by showing compassion towards people who are in need, showing patience to family members around the holiday season or 
serving those when a need pops up. And listen, we don't do any of those things to try to earn or keep God's forgiveness and love. We do all of that as a thank you to the gift he's already given to us. You have been made holy if you are in Christ, but God's work in you is not done. Do you know what God wants from you? He wants you. He wants you set apart for him to mold you, to shape you so that you can find the joy and the peace and the meaning and the purpose that you're looking for sometimes every place else but him. He wants you. There's a well-known scene in a movie um, with a famous actor who's praying at the dinner table with his family, and he's praying to tiny newborn infant baby Jesus. Maybe you know the movie I'm talking about. And as he's praying to tiny newborn infant baby Jesus, his family interrupts and they ask him, like, why are you praying to baby Jesus and not to adult Jesus? And he says, well, look, I'm the one praying and I like the Christmas Jesus best. And to be fair, there's something magical about this time of year. There's something magical thinking about the birth of the Savior. There's something just amazing about thinking about the shepherds who are in the fields like this, these lowliest of low people. And that's who God sent the angels to, to announce the arrival of the Messiah. And the angels singing about the birth to these shepherds and these shepherds in awe and wonder, setting out to follow the star that they are told underneath that star is where Jesus would be in a manger. And as magical as that is, we can't forget that while Jesus' story on earth began in a wooden manger, his mission was to die on a wooden cross for the sins of the world. Church, Jesus came to be our perfect and final and permanent sacrifice, saving us from the consequences of our sin and allowing us to draw near to God in worship. And perhaps you need to accept that gift of forgiveness for the first time. You have been trying to get to God based on your good works. And I commend you for that effort but your good deeds will never be good enough. You can't earn your way to God. If that were the case, we wouldn't need Jesus, but we do. And so perhaps you need to surrender your own works and trust in the work that God has done through Jesus and offer yourself to God, not to gain his love, but as a thank you for his love. We would love to talk to you about what it means to say yes to Jesus, to be united in the waters of baptism as your public declaration of your faith in his forgiveness through Jesus. Perhaps you've already made that decision. And so for you, the invitation is to trust in Jesus as your only hope. Like your obedience to his word, his invitation to draw near, to turn away from the things of the world. Again, not to earn anything or to gain anything, but just as a thank you for his love for you. I, if you've already surrendered your life to Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I just pray that you would just breathe deep in the peace knowing that you are already forgiven and then step into the holiness that is already yours so that God can lead you into the plans that he has for your life that are way better than your own. I want to invite you to stand. We're going to respond to God in a song of worship. This is our opportunity to just to, to declare with our voices, with our bodies, what we believe, 
what we desire to believe, what we hope to see true in our lives. And the only way we're going to surrender ourselves over to God is that we look around us, we look in our own lives, and we see the evidence of his goodness. And there is no greater evidence of God's goodness than the gift of his son, Jesus, on the cross. Perhaps you need to come and you need to pray and you just need to repent for trying to get to God on your own or repent from some things that have taken you away from God and to draw near to God in confidence, not because of you, but because of Jesus. If that's the case, we invite you to come up here and pray. Just ask God to do a new work in your life. Let me pray for us and let's just respond to God in worship, thanking him for the gift of his son. Father God, we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. God, that he is our perfect and final and permanent sacrifice. That you have freed us from our sins once and for all. God, I pray if there's someone here that has not accepted that gift, God, that you would just impress upon their hearts their need for you. God, for those of us who have maybe been stuck turning away or maybe not believing that you can forgive, God, would you remind us, even as we sing, that you want to and can forgive us. God, thank you for the gift of Jesus. And so we worship you and we praise you, not only now, but God, may this be uh, a line in the sand, the day that we say from this point forward, we're going to live for you as a thank you with our lives. God, we love you and we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's sing to him. All throughout the history Your faithfulness has walked beside me Storms made way for spring in every season from where I'm standing. I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. I see your promises in fulfilled. you are.
Can we thank God for Jesus? I love that last line, like, why should we fear? Because the evidence is here. Do you know the number one command in the Old Testament? It repeats over and over again. It's do not be afraid. <laughs> do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. For the Lord is with us, and he has sent us the gift of Jesus. And that's why this part of our service is so important each week, and we take just a little tiny piece of bread and a little cup of juice that symbolizes the body and the blood of Jesus given for us that we might receive forgiveness of sins, that we might draw near to God in worship. And so let's celebrate that gift together by taking the bread and taking and eating, remembering Jesus. And the juice that symbolizes his blood poured out for us. Let's take and drink that together. A couple things I want to remind you about before I pray and we'll be dismissed. Again, don't forget next week, Christmas Eve services. Uh, the one extra one, uh, one o'clock on Sunday afternoon. We, we can't wait for this next weekend and to celebrate together. Make sure you invite someone. Like Donnie said, it's a great opportunity to bring someone to church, maybe for the first time. And if we could be praying for you, anything you got going on, we would love to meet you down front and pray for you after the services. I'll be here and maybe a few of, other, of our other pastors will be here to pray for you. But let me close us in a word of prayer. Father God, thank you for... Just a reminder of the gift of Jesus, his birth, his life, his death on the cross, and his resurrection, conquering death once and for all. God, would you help us to live in the confidence of who we are in you, not in the confidence of our own works, our own flesh, our own failures, but God, knowing that you want to redeem our lives, to set us apart, to sanctify us for a purpose greater than anything we could imagine on our own. Teach us to trust you and to step into that holiness every single day. God, help us to live on mission, that this would not just be about ourselves, but this would be about helping our neighbors and our family and our children and our parents come to know you through us, ultimately by the power of your spirit at work in us. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. We love you. Have a great week. God bless. We'll see you next week.